Good morning and welcome to the second day of our workshop communicating across the cosmos. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our first speaker for the day, John Richards, a colleague of mine at the SETI Institute. Uh, John is a senior software engineer at the SETI Institute uh, and he's been here since 2008. John manages the SETI signal observing at our telescope, uh, the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, before John came to the SETI Institute, he was involved in several software startups. He developed home automation products in Tokyo and he oversaw various software and hardware projects over the past 25 years. Uh, John lives northeast of Sacramento, California, about halfway between uh, the SETI Institute and the Allen Telescope Array which is actually very convenient because John is often up at the uh, telescope. Uh, John is, is one of those uh, rare engineers who has expertise in both uh, software and hardware and the system is always uh, evolving uh, and in large part it's uh, due to his expertise. So I'm, I'm pleased to introduce John today to talk to us about the Allen Telescope Array. John. Hello. So, um, show of hands, how many people know about the Allen Telescope Array? Okay, that's good, because uh, a lot of times I go to these conferences or SETI events and almost nobody's heard of the ATA. They, they like SETI, they're interested in SETI, and one of the big things they're interested in SETI about is, well, we, we get these, receive these signals, but people don't really know how we actually get the signals. And uh, we get it through the Allen Telescope Array, uh, which is located in Northern California. So I got this map I drew. Um, so the arrow is where we're at now. And if you drive six hours north, uh, there you go up to Redding and then over east about an hour and a half and you reach the Allen Telescope Array. And it's way out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's in a big bowl surrounded by mountains. It's, there's not much radio frequency interference. Uh, and so it's a very nice place to have a radio telescope. I got this image off of uh, Google Earth, and here's a, a, a sky eye view of the place. There's 42 dishes. Each dish is uh, six meters in diameter and can point uh, anywhere in the sky. Commonly, we point them all in one direction and form a beam and see if we can see signals from the sky. And our frequency range we receive is 1 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz currently. So what, what are we actually receiving? Well, mostly we're re receiving static, but um, through the static we're looking for signals. And here's an example of a typical signal. Um, as if you can uh, squint your eyes, sort of, you can kind of see that it's mostly static, but I've I've pointed to where the uh, signal is showing, and the, um, the system has capability to see signals down to a one hertz resolution. So what we're looking for in the sky are very narrow band signals uh, coming from somewhere with an appropriate Doppler shift. If you, you can see that signal, you can see that it's actually shifted in, in frequency and time uh, over time. So uh, this is the kind of signal that we're, that we're looking for. The system is designed to look for very, very weak signals. So if we point them towards uh, satellites that are broadcasting, like weather satellites, we have to tone down our system because those are very bright. We're looking for very weak signals in the noise. Um, one of the things I've been doing, which I personally find interesting, I've been trying to see if I can see the spacecraft that, that uh, various organizations have up there. So, we're testing out the system. So Voyager, we can see Voyager regularly. It's getting you know, fainter and fainter as time goes by. But um, the top picture there, you can definitely see narrow band signal drifting um, appropriately because of Doppler shift over time. Uh, today, I guess, did the, did the Rosetta spacecraft land its probe? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. So it's very strong. We're able to see the Rosetta. Um, and several other ones, Cassini and ISEE-3. Um, we commonly see signals that we have no idea what they are or they're radio frequency interference. Um, and here's a couple of examples. You see at the top there, 
this is a signal that looks like it kind of has a Doppler shift, but it has a very bad, uh, you know, clock that's drifting. So, it, so we see that this signal actually quite a bit. I don't know what this is. This must be something local to our system. Um, the, the bottom one is just a very, very faint um, picture it, it, or signal. You can see that it's kind of drifting a little bit. Um, but yeah, again, it, yeah, good, turn the lights off. Yeah, it's very faint. You can see the very faint. That, these are the common things that we see uh, night after night. So our system tries to uh, determine automatically if we're seeing radio frequency interference or if we're actually seeing a real signal. And the way that we do that is if we see a narrow band signal come in and it is not shifting in frequency over time, uh, we know that's something land-based, some radio frequency interference that's on Earth because it's not moving with respect to the Allen Telescope Array. So a signal that we're going to see that we're going to be interested in from space is going to have a Doppler shift because of our rotation or their rotation or the combination. Um, the system is fairly automatic. Once we get it up and running every night, um, we down there in the green screen, you can see that we get all these reports that are generated. We have a database. Has, so in the morning, we can get up and we can see all the uh, signals that have been seen. Um, I publish on our, my website uh, all, the, all these uh, signal images uh, every night so people can look at them. Um, but it's fairly automatic. Um, so what we do to, to try to make sure that a signal is really a signal that we're interested in is if we see a signal that has a Doppler shift, we don't think it's radio frequency interference, we actually look away from it to, to another part in the sky. And if we see that same signal somewhere else, well, we know that was radio frequency interference. Um, but if we don't see it, we go back and we look. And this is all automatic, by the way. Uh, we look and see if we see the signal. If we see the signal again, we'll look off again. And we do this, uh, this back and forth, back and forth five times. And if that happens, um, we get an email. And it gets put in the database. And this is something that we... Uh, look at at a later date, probably the next morning. Um, and we can trigger this to happen if we tell it to look at uh, Voyager. So we, we say, we, we tell it to point in the direction of Voyager, tell us do you see any signals. And it will uh, see it, look off, not see it, look on, see it, blah, 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 and back and forth five times. And we pop, we get the email saying, something is in the sky at this uh, location, you need to look. It passed all five steps. So um, the system is fairly automatic. Like Seth mentioned that uh, if we're broadcasting to somebody, hopefully there's a machine on the other side. Well, this is the machine. Uh, we we uh, operate from 7 o'clock at night till 7 in the morning. The rest of the time, uh, the site is run by Stanford Research International. And they get the site for uh, 12 hours a day to use it for radio astronomy. Uh, and they're trying to get contracts to uh, fund the site. Uh, another thing we can do, other than um, just looking for narrowband signals, we have an interferometer, which means we have all these 42 dishes spread around. We can combine uh, their signals with each other and actually create images of the sky like a camera. Um, so, for instance, here's something I did a couple years ago, uh, Cassiopeia A. Uh, this was from an eight-hour observation. And it looks really fuzzy, but if you actually look at it compared to the uh, really expensive one there on top, that's, that's from uh, composite from Hubble, Spitzer, and the Chandra uh, X-ray Observatory. Okay, so we're much less expensive, much, much smaller. Uh, and we got a pretty good um, uh, picture of Cass Cassiopeia. Um, and down below, you can see some other uh, pictures we've looked at, or we're able to gather with the Allen Telescope Array, M31 and M33. And I believe these were done in uh, around 1420 megahertz. So you're, you're seeing the, um, the brightness of the hydrogen from those galaxies. So it's a unique instrument in that we can do the interferometry and the narrowband signal search uh, at the same time. 
Um, our current searching that we're doing, we're just wrapping up looking at a lot of the Kepler targets. So the Kepler mission has ended, but they still have all this data. and They're still adding planets, uh, candidate planets. And we have a list of, of 103, the, most, the top most candidates uh, that they've identified. And we've looked at all those candidates from 1 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz already. Uh, and we've looked at a lot more of these candidates. There's, there's like 3,000 of these candidates in our database. And, um, on the left there is what it looks like in a, in a sky map, and on the right is actually the red dots are actually the ones that we observed. So you see, if you plot out the ones we observed, you actually see the grid of the, of the Kepler mission. Um, but um, we have uh, the future to look forward to. So the immediate future is next year we're getting a uh, new feed, antenna feed, put in each one of the dishes. Currently, as I said, we can receive between a 1 and 10 gigahertz. This one should raise it up to 15 gigahertz and also lower the system noise. So by the time this year, uh, this time next year, we should have a system that's a lot better. Uh, system noise is one of the uh, gotchas with these kind of systems. And uh, we should have a, a much better system next year. Um, and also, we're kind of phasing, we're, get, we're thinking we're going to phase out of the Kepler targets and phase into uh, looking at red dwarfs. So you see that second picture there, it looks like some kind of bug. That's actually this, the, the red dwarf, that, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, catalog. If you plot those out in, on, in uh, right ascension declination, you get this bug shape. And that's what we're going to be uh, probably looking at next. Um, and the, but the ultimate goal for the site is to be able to, to achieve enough funding to be able to have 350 dishes. If we had 350 dishes versus the 42 we have now, the site would be totally populated, much larger, and it would be a, uh, radio astronomy on a much grander scale. So that's the eventual goal, is to have 350 telescopes. If you know anybody that wants to help us purchase 350, well, no, 308. Uh, dishes, let us know. And that's it. Anybody got questions? Oh, uh, one more thing. Visit my site regularly. So I got this site I put up called SETIQuest.info and um, I have uh, our schedule, our observing schedule, and then when we're actually observing this, that top red dish icon turns into uh, a display of what we're actually looking at, you know, tells you the RN deck and the frequency we're looking at. And over there on the left menu, I have uh, interesting images and the spacecraft we've been looking at and, and other such things. So I appreciate if you guys could go there and look. And so if you come there tonight at about 7 o'clock, you'll be starting? Yeah. Okay, you'll, great. You'll see that red icon start changing, and, and it takes about an hour for us to do our calibrations, and then we're up and running. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, Al Harris. Yeah, the, fascinating. I think somebody mentioned yesterday that uh, the, the SETI and other tasks are segmented, and my question is, is there any way to piggyback SETI onto other, other research, as has been done in some cases, or is that not really uh, uh, very practical in the present situation? Uh, that's a good question. What would you say, Seth? <laughs> Yeah. The problem is that you have to make a trade-off. It's going to trade off this microphone. Yeah, we get this 12 hours every day. Yeah, that, that's a lot. You know, that's within a factor of two being all the time, isn't it? Yeah. So but the, the thing is, if you're using somebody's other, somebody else's instrument, either you get a very small allocation of time, okay, so very little observing time, or as, for example, Berkeley is willing to do, you do not control where the antenna is pointing. Okay, and if you say, look, I don't know where ET is anyhow, I don't care where the antenna is pointing, maybe that's a worthwhile trade-off. They consider it is because they get the use of a very big antenna. But we've always been interested in targeted searches where you make some sort of guess about where you should be looking. John has described some of those targets. And then you need to control the telescope. SETI has been done for half a century using somebody else's equipment, and I liken that to trying to do cancer research, but always having to borrow a microscope. It's better if you have your own. Thank you. 
Uh, I'd like to know what you think of the future potential for SETI uh, involving the square kilometre ar array. Um, we, I have not had anything to do with the square kilometre array. Jill is the one that would know that one. Um, the square kilometre array, if it's built in the way it's currently designed to be built, will have many simultaneous beams on the sky, some of which could be used for SETI in a continuous fashion. Um, however, there will be financial pressures on that telescope and how many beams actually get built remains to be seen. Yet we have just rewritten the chapter on the science case for SETI in the, um, the official engineering book. So at the moment, SETI's on their horizon. Other questions? Yes. Uh, just a naive clarifying question. Is the Doppler shift the only way how you distinguish local source from, from something uh, else? Well, another way is if the signal is extremely strong. Uh, those, are the two, those are the two common ways. If, it's, yeah, the, if there's no Doppler shift or it's really, really strong, the system says, um, this is radio frequency interference. Yeah. Thank you. Also, since we look at the three beams simultaneously, um, and they're all orthogonal, if you see the same signal in multiple beams, yes. it's uh, also interference. Any more questions? Thank you. If not, let's give John a hand. Thank you.